Good morning. How are you guys doing? Ready for one more? Uh, OK. I don't have uh, television clips to show you, and I don't have Muppets. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, but I do want to introduce you to a really important person named Nestor Garcia, who was featured in Washington Monthly's recent edition on, on colleges. Nestor is one of six children, the son of working class Mexican immigrants, and thanks to the work of many in this room uh, improving K-12 education, Nestor graduated high school college ready with a, a 3.5 G point A, no less. But here's what happened when Nestor went to college to pursue his dream of becoming an engineer. He had to apply, he only applied to local colleges because he needed to keep his job and live at home in order to save money. And tuition was a huge uh, consideration for him. So he chose the college that offered him a $1,000 scholarship and he took out loans. But when he got to the college, he, he couldn't find advisors to help him choose classes. The financial aid office gave him inaccurate information that put him behind, and the, and the classes were terrible, and he couldn't find tutors to help him catch up. Had Nestor decided to drop out, it would not have been a surprise, but he would have not have been ahead one bit in achieving the dreams that he came to that college to try to pursue, and he would have ended up with a mountain of debt. And who could blame him for, for stepping back from that kind of that kind of circumstance. And the sad thing is that three out of four students like Nestor in this country do give up. But he was lucky. Two of his professors saw his potential and they helped him transfer to a nearby university where he got good teaching, he got support, uh, and he even got, uh, he even got help with job placement and internship opportunities. So here is what I wish Nestor would have known. The college that he, students like him at the college where he started had a 37% chance of graduating. And students at the second college that he went to had a 57% chance of graduating. Same community, miles apart. So how can this difference be? The answer is that Nestor started out at a college dropout factory. Harsh words, but too often uh, true for too many students in America. And we all have spent a lot of our time focused on high school dropout factories. We've drawn attention to that issue and have been trying to shift, uh, shift away from students experiencing that kind of school. But if you take the 50 worst college dropout factories in America, they enroll over 200,000 students a year, and they graduate 27,000 students. $200 million of Pell Grants are spent at those institutions for students who never graduate. And that is a huge waste of public resources and private dreams. Because if you drop out of college, it sets you back in your dreams and it limits your opportunity. As each of, of my colleagues said, in America today, to get a well-paying job requires some kind of credential beyond high school. If you look back in June at unemployment rates, the unemployment rates for people that have gone to a four-year college were about 4%, but for people with only a high school diploma, they were over 11%. And that's a huge difference. By 20, uh, let's see, 2023, 63% uh, of all jobs in America will require an education beyond high school. So we need to add to the efforts that we've made to improve high school, a focus on college completion. Because a high school diploma can't be the end of the story. It gets you halfway across the bridge to opportunity, but half a bridge still drops you into the chasm. Times have changed, both for our economy and for young people seeking degrees. But our higher education system has not kept pace with those changes. Over the past 50 years, we as a country have had dramatic success in, in increasing access to college, and that is a good thing. But in that same period of time, college completion rates have stayed absolutely flat, uh, and we graduate fewer than 50% of all students who start, college, who start on, on a college degree. And at the same time, the amount of time it takes for a student to earn a degree has gone up, so that it takes most students, half of all students who complete a college credential takes six years to do it. At a two-year college, it takes them 
three years to get a two-year credential. So we have a lot of change in front of us. The way we deliver higher education has not evolved to accommodate who students are today. They commute or attend part-time, they're working, they're first generation, they're caring for a parent or a child. All told, 75% of college students in America are what most of us would consider non-traditional students. Non-traditional is the new traditional. And for these students, access without success is a hollow promise. We need a dramatic new commitment to college completion to complement our traditional focus on access. I believe that America can do this because America has done it before. Time and again, we've reshaped our higher education system in response to changing social and economic needs. If you think about the story of the community college movement uh, back in the 1960s, we opened roughly one community college, new community college in this country a week during that period of time in response to changing social and, and, uh, and economic needs. We expanded access to this uniquely American institution. And now we need a similar commitment, not just to getting students in the door, but out the other side with a diploma. That's what we're working on at the Gates Foundation, and we need your help. Just as philanthropy has done in K-12, we need to identify those places where students are most likely to fall through the post-secondary cracks. And once we identify those danger zones, we need to invest our time and energy in helping students get through them. We believe that philanthropy can make a big difference in three areas. The first is restructuring the student experience. The second is making teaching and learning more effective. No surprise to this room. And the third is using data to target interventions where they can make the most difference. So let me give you a couple of quick examples about what I mean uh, by each and why I'm hopeful we can succeed. First, restructuring the student experience to help students get and keep momentum to and through college. With so much at stake, today's students need clear pathways to quality credentials. And they must have predictable schedules that they can count on in order to balance school and work. But in our colleges, as in all aspects of American life, we have consistently made decisions over the past decades in favor of more. More time, more choice, more flexibility. And these good intentions have led colleges to become extended periods of self-discovery. They've produced course catalogs the size of phone books and chaotic schedules that are poorly matched to the needs of today's students. Because when it comes to degree completion, especially if you're a low-income student, time is the enemy. For the new traditional student, a longer road leads to more potholes and more chances to take a different exit. So what about delaying college, waiting a year or two to earn some money and then starting? As many of you know, I can see you shaking your head, uh, the data show that if you wait one year after high school to start a four-year college, your chances of completion go down by 50%. This is average young Americans, not the gap year students who are gonna go off uh, to Europe for a year. And if you wait another year after that, your chances of finishing a BA degree go down by another 50%. If you wait until you're 26 to enroll in a traditional four-year college, you have only a 3% chance of earning a BA. This is why the Gates Foundation is so focused on the goal of getting many more young people to earn a credential beyond high school by the time they're 26 years old. We need, together, to re-engineer the education pipeline backwards from that goal. We need to turbocharge education, optimizing the use of time and the results achieved in that time. So many of you are already investing in ways to make sure that middle and high school students are thinking about and preparing for the college experience. You're getting information about post-secondary options to students earlier, and you're developing new ways to help students apply for financial aid. You're creating dual enrollment and early college high school programs that are helping high school students get a head start on college level work and credits. We need to add to those efforts a new message. Don't delay. Let's not confuse liberal arts 
with liberal aims. If the aim is to allow more people to make the most of the potential they have, they often need focus and clearer options. One of my favorite examples is the success over the past 20 years of the public uh, Tennessee technology centers, which regularly accomplish graduation rates of 75% or more and job placement rates of 85%. Every year, over 12,000 students go through these campuses, and nearly all of them head straight into jobs. So here's what they do. Students sign up for a whole program of study, not for individual courses. They're clearly told at the beginning how long the program will take to complete, the likelihood of success for a student like them, and the total all-in costs. They attend classes every day, Monday through Friday, from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Full-time attendance is much more possible for many more students, dramatically reducing the time it takes them to a degree. And finding jobs with such a predictable daily routine is no longer a challenge. But these compressed class schedules also create stronger personal linkages and deeper community. Professors interact with each other more often, and they tend to create team approaches to teaching the students they share. And students move through programs as a group, strengthening their ties and support of one another. The City University of New York uses similar approaches. Its ASAP program for accelerated completion of associate's degrees is so successful that the system will soon open a new community college designed to utilize block scheduling, student cohorts, directed choice, and reinvented student supports. Now why are they making this kind of significant investment in, these, in the midst of a budget crisis? Because it works so well. ASAP students graduate on time at twice the rate of their peers. So reshaping the student experience to enable a clearer and faster path to a degree is one important area for our attention and our innovation. But of course, structuring the right path to the right classroom isn't enough. We also have to focus on what goes on inside the classroom. So our second key challenge is improving the effectiveness of teaching and learning, something K-12 reformers have been focusing on for a long time. One of the investments we're making is in redesigning the courses that are the biggest loss points for students, developmental math and English, and the 24 introductory lecture courses that the majority of freshmen and sophomores take. We're funding Carnegie Mellon University to design the best versions of these courses um, for community college students. And in their open learning initiative, they've used technology. Uh, they've invented hybrid models that combine digital and classroom teaching to accelerate student learning. In one project, a college statistics course was taught in two different ways. A traditional class, which lasted 15 weeks with four class meetings a week, and a hybrid one of online course material, which held two classroom meetings a week and lasted half as long, seven and a half weeks. OLI brought together cognitive scientists who understand learning, curriculum designers, and math professors to create, um, in essence, an intelligent tutoring system so that when students were doing their homework outside of class, it, the system helped them practice all the key concepts, in essence, by using the thinking that an expert would use to solve those problems over and over again every week. But even more powerful, the technology lets the professors see exactly where their students are struggling each week so that when they, they can target their classroom lectures on, a, uh, on the places that students need help most. The model was found to dramatically improve course completion rates and the, the mastery of subject material and its retention six months later in half the time. So finally, what about using data to target interventions where they can make the most difference? Many of you have invested in research to determine the risk factors among ninth graders that derail a student from the path to high school graduation. And you're using, or you're helping schools use that data to identify these young people early and get them the supports they need. This is exactly what needs to happen at the post-secondary level. One of our partners, Valencia Community College, has used data to figure out that getting through the first five courses that a student takes on the first attempt is the best predictor that a student will graduate. So they've 